blessed this morning for worshiping, worshiping with us wherever you're watching. Now let's just get ready as we get ready to give. Hello, Praise Chapel Garden Grove. Uh, this is Pastor Albert, and today I have been given the honor and the privilege of uh, taking up uh, the offering. Now, I know that this is a very common statement that most people make when they're taking up the offering, and that I've been given the honor and the privilege, uh, most likely from the pastor, to take up the offering. But I've been given the, off the opportunity today by the Lord to take up our morning offering. And so I count this opportunity truly a great blessing and an honor to me as the pastor of the church. And I take it very seriously. Uh, I want you to open your Bibles to the book of Luke chapter 6, verse 38. And I want you to consider what Jesus says. This, this writing is in red, indicating that they are the words of Jesus. He says this, Give and it will be given to you. Now there, there is a statement there that it, it, it merits us paying attention. He says, give and it will be given to you. We normally just read right through there and we don't pause long enough to discover that there is a conditional statement being made by the Lord. He says, give and it will be given to you. And then he says how it will be given back. He says, a good measure pressed down, shaken together and running over, will be poured into your lap. And then he adds us something again, which I believe is another conditional statement. He says, for with the measure that you use, it will be measured to you. He is saying with the same measure that you use to give will be the same measure that will be used to give back to you. Now, most of you, Maybe some of you have, but most of you have not heard the name R.G. Latorno. R.G. Latorno. R.G. Latorno was a businessman, a Christian industrialist back in the 1800s who dedicated his life, and you can look up his name if you like, who dedicated his life to becoming a Christian businessman for God. R.G. Latorno. He was hugely successful in the 1800s, a very successful man. And he developed, uh, uh, the way he became successful is he developed earth move, moving equipment. He developed uh, equipment that would move dirt around the earth. Uh, and so this is how he became successful. In his career, he made over 300 inventions and had hundreds of patents in his lifetime. This is a very successful man, man, R.G. Latorno. And as he began to succeed, actually, let me correct that, uh, in his entire life, he, he tithed, and get this, he, uh, for those of you who don't know what a tithe is, a tithe is 10% of everything. 10% uh, of $100 is $10. 10% of $1,000 is $100. 10% of 10 apples is, uh, uh, is one apple. 10% of 100 apples is 10 apples. So you get the idea of what a tithe is. So this man, R.G. Latorno, uh, uh, when he began, he, he always tithe. He always gave God his 10%. But as he became successful in his business, he made a declaration before God that he was no longer going to give God 10%. A lot of rich people do that. Once you start doing better, you start hoarding. Because it's easy to give God 10% of a check of $1,000 that you get once every two weeks. But it's harder to give them a check, a tithe of a million dollars once you become successful. And this is a nature of man that they begin to hold back. R.G. Latorno, when he became, became successful... He said to the Lord, I'm no longer going to give you 10%, God. I'm going to give you 90% of everything that I make. And uh, the more he gave, the more he succeeded. And when he was asked, why are you doing that? Why are you giving God 90% of your, of your increase, of your, your money? This is what he said. Quote, 
I shovel out the money and God shovels it back. But God has a bigger shovel, end quote. He said, I shovel the money to God and God sh shovels it back. But I realized something that I, God always gives me back more than I gave because God's shovel, it's much larger than mine. Now, I know what you might be thinking. Well, it's easy to give God 90% where you're, when you are a multimillionaire. Well, I'm going to tell you something. R.G. Latorno didn't start out as a millionaire. He started out as a common man just like you and I. But there was one thing and one practice he always did. He never skipped a tithe. He never skipped the tenth that belonged to the Lord. And friends, I'm going to tell you something. You've been tithing for a long time. Maybe it's time for you to start thinking God as a God with the bigger shovel. And maybe it's time to increase your giving, especially in this pandemic. Maybe it's time for you to trust God more than you ever have. Don't become like most people, that the wealthier they become, the more they hoard. Maybe you ought to be like R.G. Latorno and begin to trust God for more. Today, I want to pray for the offering. I want to bless the offering. As Jesus received the offering, he always prayed for it and always thank God for it. And I like to do the same. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for this opportunity of collecting the tithes and offerings, the gifts of your people. May their hearts, Lord, be open to receive whatever the Holy Spirit is speaking to them. May they not treat this offering as something that's standardized, Lord, something that's just common, status quo. But may they be, Father, open to the hearing of the voice of the Spirit, and may they give an increase, Father, so that you may increase their lives. We thank you for this offering. We bless it, multiply it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I want to thank you for your giving, and now the worship team. God bless you. We'll see you soon. Let's just get ready as we get ready to hear the message. Hello, Praise Chapel Garden Grove, friends and family. This is Pastor Albert, and I want to welcome you this morning to our Sunday morning service. We are excited that you are with us today. And I want to ask you to uh, turn your Bibles, please, to the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 4. 2 Timothy, chapter 4. I'm also going to ask you to please rise to your feet in the reading of the Word of God. 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning with verse 6. And it reads this way, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time of my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord the righteous judge will award me 
or award to me rather on that day. And not only to me, but also all who love or long for his appearing. And today I want to minister to you uh, on the topic, overcoming loneliness, overcoming loneliness. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, take these lips of clay and anoint them and make them vehicles, vessels of life that may protrude from me into the hearts of your people, the very words that you would set within me. And may my words, Lord, bring forth life and fruitfulness in the lives of your people. We ask for the strength of the Holy Spirit, and we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Please, right there where you're at, give God the biggest praise offering that you can, and go ahead and take a seat. Overcoming loneliness. Overcoming loneliness. Loneliness is one of the most miserable feelings that a person can actually experience. In fact, it makes you feel as though, as though nobody loves you. It makes you feel as no one cares about you. You don't have to be alone, per se, to feel lonely. You can be in a crowd of people with friends and family and still feel lonely. Everyone experiences a loneliness at one time or another in their lives. In fact, loneliness respects no man, regardless of status, creed, or color. You can be wealthy and be lonely. Uh, aviation tycoon Howard Hughes is a perfect example of what I'm talking about. He was a man very wealthy and yet experienced deep loneliness in his life. You can be beautiful and still experience loneliness. We all know about the actress Marilyn Monroe, who overdosed on, um, I, be I believe it was barbiturates, uh, because her life was so empty and so lonely. So you can be wealthy, and you can be beautiful, and you can be surrounded with friends and family and still experience a life of loneliness. You can be married. You can actually be married. And while being married to your spouse, you can actually be lonely. Uh, many people marry because they're lonely, and a few years later they divorce and end up lonely again. And friends, uh, in the urban world that we live in, people have never lived closer together, and yet never have, li never have they lived, lived further away from each other. The words here of our text that I just read you are the words of Paul the Apostle. He is writing to his friend Timothy while he himself is locked up in an underground dungeon, a prison, uh, roughly about 61 AD. He is there just a few days, possibly a few weeks from the execution of his life. Uh, Nero is about to execute him and to take his head off with a sword. And Paul knows that his days are short. And he is using this time to write a letter to one of his best friends in the ministry, who was a young pastor by the name of Timothy. This was one of the most loneliest times in the life of Paul. One of the most loneliest times. And today I want to borrow, if we can, for a few moments, from this text of Paul, in hopes that I can help you and uh, every one of us watching on how to overcome loneliness. There's no doubt that if you, if you study the text that Paul was underground on a underground prison where there was really no light of day. Uh, any light that would be present would be through the aid of a candle. The letter that he is writing is most likely being written through the aid of candlelight. And so you can imagine being down there not seeing the light of day, not knowing what tomorrow may hold for him. You could imagine how lonely he must have felt. And he writes this letter to Timothy uh, to express several things. And I think in his expression in the letter, you can find uh, keys, if you would, or principles on how to overcome 
loneliness. This is what I want to minister to you today. And I would ask you to consider two thoughts or two divisions to my message. One, the cause of loneliness. I want to talk to you about the cause of loneliness. Secondly, I want to talk to you about how to overcome loneliness. It's not enough to know the cause. I want to know how I can overcome these feelings of loneliness in my life. It was Mother Teresa, who you probably know well, who said this, quote, Loneliness and the feeling of being unwanted is the most terrible poverty, end quote. She is saying that loneliness and the feeling of being or feeling unwanted, she says, is the most terrible poverty. Now, what causes loneliness? Now, obviously, there is a cause uh, to everything. And uh, I want to talk to you about a few, for a few moments on what I believe causes loneliness. The first thing I believe would, that causes loneliness is the transitions of life. The transitions of life. Uh, life is filled with transitions and stages. We start school for the first time as children, and it is one of the first uh, events in our lives uh, when we are left off at kindergarten and we begin to experience what loneliness is being apart from our mother and father and our siblings. And then you start school and you start feeling lonely. Then uh, uh, there, uh, there are other transitions in life and other stages of life. You get a job. And you, you, you change jobs and you go into a new workplace and it's easy to feel lonely as you enter a new workplace. And then you reach the age of retirement and you get old and you, you live alone and uh, someone rarely comes to visit and, and you can experience uh, loneliness even as a retiree or as an elderly uh, uh, no matter what part of the world you may live in, uh, then you experience the death of a loved one. These are all, friends, these are all transitions in life from kindergarten to, to school to junior high to high school to college to new jobs uh, uh, to getting old. And then you get to the point uh, that you start losing loved ones. And friends, these, these are all transitions uh, and stages of life that cause a loneliness in the lives of people. In fact, it is estimated that 70%, listen to this, that 70% of people in rest homes never get anyone to visit them ever. 70% of the elderly in rest, rest homes never get a visit at all from anyone. You want purpose in your life? You don't have to look uh, very far and deep for purpose in your life. You can go to one of these rest homes and be a blessing to someone because I guarantee you that there are a lot of lonely people in these rest homes. Sometimes we bring loneliness upon ourselves. At other times, loneliness is just part of life, things that are uncontrollable, things that we cannot control. This is where Paul is, the, the writer of our text. He, he is in a situation that he cannot control. He is in prison, underground, in a rat-infesting, urine-stenching dungeon. And he is there. He is an old man now. He's come of age now. And he is in a damp, dark dungeon, lonely. And he is asking Timothy in our letter, in the text that we write, he is asking his best friend, Timothy, to come visit him. Look at verse 9 of our text. He says, Do your best to come to me quickly. Friends, Paul loved Timothy. In fact, he says in this letter, he says, I have no one else like him who has a genuine concern for your well-being. He says, everyone is out looking for themselves, but Timothy is a different breed. Timothy is a true friend to me because he is truly concerned with what concerns me, which was the church. While everyone was out doing their own thing and finding their own purpose and their own desires and fulfilling their own lives, Timothy stuck with him. But at this time, Paul is in prison and Timothy is unable to be with him. And Paul is writing to him and he's saying, please come to me quickly. I need you with me. I'm lonely. 
So I believe that the first cause of loneliness is the transitions in life, whether something that we caused or something that came without us having any control over them at all. This is the case where Paul is. He has no control of the fact that he's been arrested for the gospel of Jesus Christ and thrown into a prison, and he is soon to die as an old man through Nero's sword. Now, the second thing that I believe causes loneliness is separation, separation, being isolated from the people that we love, separated from friends and separated from family, separated from our church family. As you know, we are unable to meet indoors as a church because of the, uh, the governor, the governor gave us orders, gave all of California orders. Uh, and, and although this may seem fun in the beginning, friends, I'm going to tell you something. This separation between you and family and the house of God and the children of God, uh, it is bound to bring loneliness to your heart. Solitary confinement is one of the most devastating forms of punishment known to mankind. This is why we lock the worst of criminals, we lock them in solitary confinement because we know that the Word of God teaches us that it is not good for man to be alone. That's Genesis 2.18. This is exactly where Paul is. He is locked up in a dungeon. He is advanced in years. He is near his death and he knows it. He says, my time of my departure has come. Friends, this is a lonely place where Paul is. So if you're lonely today, I want you to know you are not alone. There's many who have gone before you and many that will come thereafter. Paul was separated from his friends from those in the ministry that he worked closely with, people that he loved, people that loved him. The situation had forced him to be separated from them. And, and, all, and, and there was a point in Paul's life uh, that when he went into prison, that those friends of his, those that were near him, those that knew him, those that worked the ministry with him, they all began to depart and abandon Paul this is why in one text he says, do not be ashamed of my chains, he says to his friends. And friends, at this venture, at this fork in Paul's life, many of his friends had deserted him and abandoned him. In fact, in verse 10, he tells us, look with me. He says, for Demas, he is naming some of his friends in the ministry. He says, for Demas, because he loved this world, he says, he has deserted me. And he has gone to Thessalonica. And then he names another one. He says, and Crescens has gone to Galatia. Listen to this. And Titus left to Dalmatia. And then he adds, but only Luke is with me. Paul is saying, everyone has abandoned me. I came into this dark prison and everyone has left me. Demas, because he loved the world and loved the things of the world, he went and deserted me and went to Thessalonica. Crescens uh, has gone to Galatia. Titus went to Dalmatia. And the only one that is stuck there, stuck with me, he says, is our friend Luke. Oh, hallelujah. Thank God for those who stick around, friends. Uh, in this letter, Paul reminds Timothy that of, of, the, of these things. He reminds them that Demas left him, that Crescens had left him, that Titus left him. And then he reminds Timothy twice. He says, they've all left me, Timothy. And then he reminds him twice. He says, please come visit me. Please come visit me. In verse 9, look what he says. Do your best to come to me quickly. And in verse 21, he repeats it again. He says, do your best to get here before winter. Oh, glory to God. Paul is lonely. Here's a man of great caliber. Here's a man with great potential. Here's a man that wrote one third of the New Testament. Here's a man who called himself an apostle born out of time. Here's a man that did more than most of the apostles. And yet at this point of his life, he is experiencing such deep loneliness. So don't lonely because his friends in the ministry have left him. And he is asking Timothy, please come and visit me. These are the things that cause 
loneliness, separation. Now thirdly, something else that would cause loneliness is opposition. Opposition. Look what he says in verse 14. He says, Alexander, the metal worker, did me a great deal of harm. Paul is saying this man, Alexander, which we don't, we don't know a lot about. We know he, he was a, a metal worker, a blacksmith of some kind. We know that he did Paul a great deal of harm. Paul is in prison. Now, you gotta, you got to understand this. He is old. He is in prison. He is near death. He is probably cold because it was underground. And, and, and everyone has left him. And, and, and here comes Alexander, the metal worker, and now he attacks him. We don't know what was, what was the, the, uh, the nature of the attack, but we do know that there was opposition from this man, this metal worker, Alexander. And, and, and I'm going to tell you something, friends. Some of the meanest things are, are usually said and done when we are at our lowest points. It's like there are people that it seems like they're messengers of Satan that just come to pour salt over our wounds in the worst possible time. Have you ever had that happen to you? Well, Paul experienced this. Alexander, the metal worker, did him much harm, he says. Children have the tendency to do this in the playground. You ever remember, you ever remember being a kid and being picked on in school? Remember when, when they picked on you or bullied, on, bullied you, uh, how lonely you felt? You felt like an outcast, like nobody loved you, like nobody cared. I, I had that experience in, in high school. Uh, excuse me, it was in junior high. There was a young man by the name of Stuart. I, you may have heard the story before in junior high and this is where I began to experience peer pressure. I remember being in science class. Uh, uh, and there was a girl in science class that I really had a crush on. I, I can't remember. I think her name was, uh, I believe her name, her name was Elaine. In, 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 uh, Elaine. We have an, we an Elaine in church. It's not the Elaine in church. She's much younger than I am. Uh, but this girl, girl, Elaine, she sat right next to me. And right on the other side of me was this, uh, this young man by the name of Stuart. And he picked on me every single day. He bullied me. It was so embarrassing because he would tell me things. Uh, he made fun of my clothes. He made fun of my, the way I walked. Uh, he called me names. Uh, uh, and, and, and usually he was pretty good at bullying people. He was pretty smart and very, uh, very good at, at his words. And, and he just bullied and bullied and bullied me. Friends, and, and I'm going to tell you something. Uh, you, you ever get to that point of your life that you're just fed up? And I remember that, that, that one day that, that, that he, he just began to oppose me and laugh about me and, and speak evil of me and over and over. And I, and I remember I had had it. I, I just had enough. And, and we walked outside uh, where we were. The class was upstairs. And I remember he, he called me one more name. He pushed me around and I, and I, and, and I, uh, I reacted and I just pushed him. And he fell down the stairs and he never once picked on me again. Now, I don't advise anyone to do that. Uh, I, I just I was just fed up. I was lonely. Everyone laughing at you, everyone mocking you because Stuart was, was the, the one that was causing all the opposition, all the chaos. Uh, and, and friend, this is what happens uh, to us uh, when we face opposition. This, were, this is where Paul was. Uh, uh, he had faced the opposition of Alexander, the metal worker, and, and, and this only added uh, to his loneliness. And so opposition has a way of adding to our loneliness. The, the, uh, the, fourth, uh, the, the fourth thing that would cause, uh, excuse me, that would cause us to feel lonely is rejection. When we are rejected, uh, I, I believe that this is the most serious of all of them is rejection. Uh, it, this is, it makes you feel when you're rejected. It makes you feel that you've been betrayed. Uh, it makes you feel forsaken, abandoned. And, and uh, 
especially when you are abandoned and rejected by the people who are closest to you. This is where Paul is. He has been rejected and abandoned by the people that are most close to him. He feels deserted. He feels abandoned. In fact, consider with me what he says uh, 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 as to when he appears before the courts in the presence of Nero, which was the governor, the one that would later execute him. Uh, listen to what he, he listen to his account of that court date in which he went to defend himself. In verse 16, he says, At my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. Imagine that. He is old, he is advanced in years, he is serving time in prison. For, for, uh, for the gospel. He is in a dub, in a damned, uh, darkened dungeon. He doesn't see the light of day. They, they bring him up to, to, uh, to the courthouse to, to be judged by Nero, who would later execute him. He looks around in the courthouse, and there's nobody there. Uh, the, the Demas is not there. Crescens is not there. Uh, Titus is not there. He is there by himself. And then he says, every one of them left me when I needed them the most. When I needed them the most, they abandoned me because they went out to do their own pursuits and their own desires and their own things. Uh, you could hear the pain in Paul's voice, friends. Uh, see, when, when, when things get tough, People leave. When trials warm up, uh, nobody was there with them. Nobody spoke in his defense. Everyone copped out and left him and abandoned him. This is what he is saying. Uh, and, I, and I want you to know something, friend. This is contrary to what Jesus taught us in the Gospels. In fact, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, verse 12, Jesus said this so. Every, in everything, look what he says, in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Jesus is saying, this is the principle that we live by as brothers and sisters, that you do to others in everything what you would have them do to you. What, what these men should have done is they should have been there for Paul in his tough times. They should have never abandoned him. They should have been there with him. And friends, this is what caused uh, this elevated loneliness in Paul's life. Not just uh, that he's alone in a dungeon, but the very fact that no one is there with him. In fact, Paul himself writes in 1 Corinthians 24, he says, no one should seek their own. Listen to the rebuke. He says, no one should seek their own good, but the good of others. Paul is saying, he is saying this, he says, we ought to seek the well-being and the good of others and not our own good. And so these are the things, I believe, that cause a loneliness in our lives. Now, I want to close with how to overcome loneliness. If you're watching me today and you're feeling lonely, if you're going through it, if people have abandoned you, if some have deserted you, if your friends have left you in the tough times, here's how you overcome it. I, I pray that these principles taken and drawn from God's Word may help you. Number one, if you're going to overcome loneliness, utilize your time wisely. Utilize your time wisely, meaning make the best of your time. Make the best of the bad situation. Don't just sit around moping and doing nothing. Friends, loneliness has a way of paralyzing us if you allow it. Amen. There's an old saying that you know well. It says, if life gives you lemons, make lemonade. Hallelujah. And right now, I just feel like having a glass of lemonade, to be frank with you. Amen. But if life gives you lemon, don't just sit around and mope about it. Uh, don't sit around and complain. Just listen. Make lemonade. Do the best with what you have. This is what Paul did. 
Listen, listen to what he writes to Timothy. He says in verse 13, and when you come, he, he is confident that Timothy is coming. That's his best friend. He says, see, there, are, there, there are some that will call themselves friends, but a faithful man, says the word of God, who can really find? Timothy was faithful to him. And listen to what he says in verse 3. And when you come, bring the cloak, the jacket that I left with carpus at Trowers. And my scrolls, especially my parchments. What was Paul asking Timothy to bring? He was telling him to bring several things. His coat, because winter was coming. He was also telling him to bring his scrolls and his parchment. Why would they Paul want scrolls and parchment? Because Paul was going to utilize his time to write. He was going to write the very letters that we read about later on in the New Testament. You see, friends, Paul could have sat there and complained all his life while in the dungeon. He could have complained. He could have moped. He could have said, is this what I get for 30 years of ministerial service? A dark Damp, urine stenching, rat infested dungeon. Is this the reward of a man of God after 30 years of service? He could have sat around and complained about it. He could have said, is this the reward that I get for pastoring and pioneering and opening several churches? Is this the reward, the recompense of, uh, to die here in loneliness in a dark, damp dungeon? Is this what I look forward to? Friends, he could have complained, but he says to Timothy, no, 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 no. He says, bring my scrolls and bring my parchments, because while I'm here in this dungeon, I'm going to make the best of my time, and I'm going to write, and I'm going to write letters, and I'm going to write epistles. Uh, and friends, uh, God could have taken him out of prison, but he left him in prison. And I'll tell you why, because today we read the New Testament, and most of the New Testament was written while Paul was in prison. Oh, hallelujah. This is why the Word of God tells us in the book, in the book of Romans chapter 8, 28, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those that love Him and are called according to His purpose. So if we are going to overcome loneliness, make the best of your time. Make the best, not just of your time, make the best of the bad times. Now, secondly, and I'm almost done, if we're going to overcome loneliness, minimize your hurt. Let me say that again. Minimize your hurt. Meaning, don't exaggerate or rehearse your hurt and your pain over and over. Don't rehearse it. Don't keep saying, nobody cares about me. Nobody loves me. Nobody calls me. Friends, uh, all you're doing is adding to your loneliness. Do not allow what others do or do not do to make you bitter and make you angry. This is very common with some, some, some ministers uh, that go out into the mission fields and, and go out to pastor in faraway lands. Uh, if they don't receive a call and no one calls them, they start complaining. They don't care about me. They don't, they don't care if, if I'm dead or alive. No one calls me. No one's there for me. So, friends, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, listen, e even if they don't make the best of the time, uh, minimize the hurt. Don't exaggerate it. Don't play it over and over in your head because it's only going to lead you to more deep despair and loneliness. As you know, Paul was abandoned by his best friends. But he never allowed the abandonment, the absence of his, of his friends to embitter him in any way. In fact, look at what he says in verse 16. At my first defense, look at verse 16. He says, at my first defense, no one came to my support. Now, let me pause there for a moment. You, you got to picture this, and I'm almost done. He is standing, defending himself, uh, an innocent man. His only crime is preaching the gospel. And you would think that Timothy would be there. You would think that Titus would be there. You would think that all of his friends would be there. But nobody was there to defend him. He was there by himself. Himself. He says, at my first defense, no one came to my support. 
but everyone deserted me. And then he adds this, and you can see here, he says, may it not be held against them. You can see in Paul's words that he is not bitter. He is not saying, you guys didn't come to my defense, so forget all of you guys. You guys didn't come. You don't care. No, he didn't say none of that, friends. He says, may it not be held against them. You know what he's doing? He is interceding for those who deserted him. Now, I, I have the tendency to believe that the reason Paul is interceding for them could be because maybe the Lord will hold it against them for deserting Paul in the time of need. Maybe this is why Paul is saying, may it not be held against them. Nelson Mandela, who served 27 years in a, in a prison, who was the uh, South African uh, uh, president, and he was sent to prison innocently. After serving his term, he said this, and, and, and I pray we learn something from this. He said, quote, resentment is like drinking poison and then hoping it will kill your enemies, end quote. Resentment is like drinking poison and then hoping that it would kill your enemies. Friends, if you're going to get over loneliness, don't be bitter, don't be resentful. Just don't rehearse things in your mind. Don't maximize your pain and your hurt. Let it go. Give it to God. And may God not hold it against those who have hurt you. Now, number three, number three, I'm almost done. If I'm going to, if you are going, you and I are going to overcome loneliness, uh, we must recognize God's presence. We must recognize God's presence. Look at verse 16. I'm going to repeat verse 16 and verse 17. He says, at my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. And then he says, may it not be held against him. Now look at verse 17. He says, but the Lord stood by my side and he gave me strength. Oh, glory, glory, glory to God. Paul is saying that when I was there standing before Nero, defending myself, no one was there with me. He says, but the Lord, he was with me. He never left my side. He says, and he's the one that gave me the strength to overcome, to face the sword, to face the dungeon, to face the prison, to face the loneliness. He says, the Lord gave me the strength. Why? Because he was standing there with me. Friends, uh, if you're going to overcome loneliness, you must recognize the presence of God. This is what Paul was saying. Where is God when we are lonely? He's right there with you. Friends, where is God when all have left us, He is right there with you. Where is God when we are in despair and distraught? He is there with you. Friends, it is a promise. Jesus said in John 14, 18, I will not leave you as orphans. In the book of Hebrews 13, 5, God said, never will I leave you. And never will I forsake you. Friends, in order to overcome loneliness, we must seek His presence. That, that We don't have to seek it in a sense of finding it, but we must rather recognize that His very presence is here with us. Consider what the psalmist said in the heat of battle when Saul the king was trying to take his life. He said in Psalm 139 verse 8, Where can I go from your spirit? He says, where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you are there. He said, if I make my, my bed in the depths, you are there. So the psalmist is saying, Saul can persecute me. Saul can try to kill me. But I want, I want you to know something, that no matter where I go, no matter what I run to, he says, the presence of God is there with me. In order for us to overcome loneliness, we must not seek the presence of God. We must recognize that the very presence of God is there with us. And then lastly, 
and closing, and I leave you with this, in order to overcome loneliness, empathize with the needs of others. Empathize with the needs of others. You can actually use the word sympathize if you prefer. The best way, friends, and I leave the, the best for last, the best way that you and I can overcome loneliness is to empathize with the needs of others, is to help others who are also lonely, to focus no longer on ourselves, but to focus our attention on others. As we help others overcome their distraught, their loneliness, we will overcome our very own loneliness. This is what Paul did, friends. In his loneliness, he didn't pout, he didn't walk around complaining, but his whole aim in his time of loneliness was how can I serve others? The passion of Paul's heart was to see the Gentiles saved. His goal was to see them come to Christ. And this is what drove him out of loneliness. This was his purpose in life. And listen to what he says in verse 17. But the Lord stood by my side and gave me strength so that through me, listen to what he says, through me, the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. Paul is saying, the reason I went through all of this, the reason the Lord stood by my side was to strengthen me. Not just for my own purpose, not for my own desire, but for that I can preach the gospel to the Gentiles and that they might be saved, friends. Uh, Paul, Paul had a heart for the Gentiles. Uh, and the minute he began to look for the well-being of others, this is where loneliness began to depart from his life. Friends, in order to defeat loneliness, make yourself available to others. Make yourself available to those who are hurting that may be lonely themselves. Help others overcome their loneliness and you will see that you will overcome yours. Help them defeat their depression and you will defeat yours. There are a lot of lonely people in our world, friends. They're everywhere. There are lonely people in our families. There are lonely people in our church. There are people, I guarantee you, in our church who are experiencing lonely times. And all you have to do is pick up the phone and call them. Go to their house, knock on their door, visit them. I heard one of the ladies of our church, and I won't mention the name because I don't want her blessing to be stolen from her, that went out and bought roses and flowers and went to the elderly of the church and, let, and, and deliver roses and flowers to them. You would not believe the phone calls we were receiving, uh, how blessed they were because this lady decided uh, that in her lockdown, in her quarantine, she was kind of going to come out of her own loneliness and deliver flowers to someone who may also be experiencing loneliness. This is why Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. There are lonely people everywhere. If you can just disconnect, unplug for a few moments on your own needs and your own desire and your own wants and your own aspirations and your own visions and put your heart and your focus on people who may need a warm touch, a call, a gift, a smile, you will find lonely people everywhere. Friends, they are everywhere. I want to leave you today with a song written by the Beatles back in 1966, entitled Eleanor Rigby. I want you to listen to the words of this song, and I pray that somehow it will inspire you to come out of yourself and reach out to someone who may be lonely. These are the words of the lyrics. Oh, look at all the lonely people. Look at all the lonely people. Eleanor Rigby picks up the rice in the church where the wedding has been. She lives in a dream, waits at the window, wearing the face that she keeps in a jar by the door. Who is it for? All the lonely people 
Where do they all come from? All the lonely people. Where do they all belong? Father Mackenzie, writing the words of a sermon that no one will hear. No one comes near. Look at him working, darning his socks in the night when there's no one there. What does he care? All the lonely people. Where do they all come from? All the lonely people. Where do they all belong? All the lonely people. And then he continues, Eleanor Rigby died in the church and was buried along with her name. Nobody came. Father Mackenzie, wiping the dirt from his hands as he walks from the grave. No one was saved. All the lonely people. Where do they all come from? All the lonely people. Where do they all belong? Friends, our world is filled with lonely people. And you and I can make a difference in our community, in our families, in our church. If you would just stop and disengage from your own desires, your own wants, your own aspiration, your own dreams, and go help someone feel better about themselves. I want to close today by making an invitation for some of you who are watching me, who may not know the Lord. You are lonely. Today, your life is in, in upheaval. Or maybe it is not, but the truth is this. If you die today, you have no assurance where you would go. Friends, I want to tell you that Jesus Christ loves you. 2,000 years ago, He died for you. And He died to forgive you of all your sins. And today, He makes the invitation to you. If you're listening to my voice today, and you would like to dedicate your heart to Jesus, you would like to turn away from your sins and come to Him, or maybe you are a backslider, you knew God at one time, but you walked away from Him, I would ask you to close your eyes right there where you're at, and pray this simple prayer with me in receiving the Lord as your personal Lord and Savior. He would forgive you of all your sins and He would cleanse you and He would lift you up from the mire and the dirt of sin. Would you close your eyes and say, Father, I am a sinner. I deserve death, hell, and the grave. But I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God and He died for me and resurrected on the third day. I receive Jesus in my heart as my Lord and Savior. I believe today that He is saving me. I give you my heart, Lord. Save me now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you did that, friend, below here, at the, there's a banner, www.praisechapelgg.com forward slash connect. You can take that web address and copy it and paste it on your web browser and let us know that you gave your heart to Jesus. Let us know that you returned back to the Lord. We want to hear from you. If you need prayer, you can do the same thing. You can take that, that web address and copy it, paste it on your, on your web browser, www.praisechapelgg.com forward slash slash, excuse me, connect. We want to hear from you. We want to pray for you. The rest of you who are watching us, listen, church, may God use you not only to drive loneliness out of your own life, but to drive loneliness out of the lives of others. God bless you. We love you. God loves you. And even if we did not love you, there's one thing you can rest assured is that Jesus Christ will always love you. God bless you.